lot of material covered so far. I, I'm going to try not to double up on it. Um, ideally, I just want to kind of to show you what's coming next. Um, obviously, uh, AI models are getting bigger and bigger. They kind of double every three and a half months or an order of magnitude, uh, more compute demand every year. Uh, at the same time, Moore's law is slowed down. So we are getting very little, maybe 10% uh, improvement every year. Uh, so we need to close this gap, right? We need these two exponentials to somehow uh, meet. Um, so <clears throat> what I want to do next is kind of give you um, both uh, kind of a differentiation with how we have approached the problem from the energy efficiency perspective um, and how GPUs approach the problem. And then kind of show you both a roadmap for our systems, but also um, as we move forward, uh, we see uh, possibly the need for more and more customization at the hardware level so we can kind of uh, tune um, the demands of the hardware of the demands of the models to the to what the the hardware can provide. So, um, as I mentioned, the large language models are getting larger. Uh, it's in the name, um, and uh, they're no longer a single chip uh, problem. Um, typically, the way these are handled is parts of these problems are kind of uh, uh, processed uh, in uh, in different uh, order. Uh, so if you look at a GPU, uh, for example, and you might have seen this slide before, uh, what you do is you typically um, uh, store a lot of data in the HPMs and you page uh, both weights and KV caches in and out of that HPM. Um, the problem with that is that you are moving a lot of data and you're moving it through a thin little straw, even though it's called high bandwidth memory. It really has the bandwidth uh, that's that's one one hundredth of the bandwidth that you can um, uh, you can leverage on the compute die. Um, beyond that, the latency to access this memory is pretty high, anywhere from three hundred nanoseconds to over a microsecond. So you're kind of paying that penalty. Um, and then for every bit that moves in and out of the DRAM, you are paying four to six picojoules per bit. So that is effectively wasted power, right? You Every time you move that data just to cycle through those weights, um, you are burning a lot of power um, just to get the data on. So uh, what HPMs do, uh, sorry, but uh, GPUs, graphics processing units do, is they typically create these large batches um, and that's how they want to amortize that uh, HBM data move. But that also ends up being costly from the aspect of latency. Um, and, um, and then uh, as the models go bigger and bigger, even bigger than a single GPU or multiple GPUs, now you're starting to suffer this asynchronous communication through switches and, um, and the high batch sizes are also uh, very large uh, tensors that you're moving back and forth, which means that the latency uh, is, is exacerbated uh, again. So this is, this is basically uh, currently how we run uh, large language models, uh, and uh, this is really inefficient. It won't scale into the future, especially as demands grow. Um, the approach that Grok has taken is more of a spatial approach. So as opposed to using HPMs and kind of time multiplexing that, what we've done is we've kind of spread out these uh, parts of the large language models that are shown in the different colors over a large number of chips. So here I show about uh, 12 chips, both tensor and parallel and uh, pipeline parallel. Um, and what we do is once we've, we've loaded these weights and KV caches, we simply stream these tokens across them and get significantly better uh, performance, but also better energy efficiency. To access SRAM, it takes you maybe five nanoseconds by the time you access it and you get the data out through uh, multiple pipe stages to, to the compute. To access SRAM, it costs only about 0.3 picojoules per bit, so 10 to 20 times lower uh, power um, or energy that you spend uh, per bit access. Um, and then because we do these very, we have this high bandwidth SRAM, we can saturate it very low batch sizes. So now we have also very high throughput. Um, so uh, this is how we achieve both the low latency, low energy uh, kind of use, but also 
overall low cost per token. We have better tokens per second per chip effectively. Okay, so how do we package this, right? This is packaged in our systems. Uh, currently, uh, the, what we've discussed so far is all in the first column. This is the SMC system that ANL currently has. Um, it has uh, eight um, LPUs in a single node. Uh, we have nine of those nodes in the rack, uh, so eight plus a redundant node. Uh, and uh, because of our networking, we can connect up to 264 of these devices with a single global hop. So that's the really the large single core clusters that we can build. So uh, like I showed in the previous slide, we have this spatial distribution of compute. Uh, we can build these large clusters and we can tackle jobs of that size effectively uh, in tensor parallel uh, way. If we go to the next generation, this would be um, uh, still based on our first generation of silicon. So our next system uh, is going to be able to connect even more of these um, of these uh, LPUs. We're escaping more CERDIs that were not escaped in the first uh, generation of systems. This gives us both better performance. It gives us also uh, better scalability. Um, and then we move uh, for the last two columns on the slide to the second generation of LPUs. Uh, so these are four nanometer devices, so they get a significant better power optimization. So far, uh, the amazing uh, results that Grok has posted are all based on 14 nanometer silicon. And just to give you a feel that 14 nanometer silicon doesn't have any HPMs, doesn't have any COAs, and it has about 30 times less devices, transistors and capacitors, than an equivalent H100, for example and yet we're achieving this performance. So it's all an architecture play. We're taking that architecture play um, and accelerating with four nanometer silicon for the second generation set of systems. And then we have this step up. Uh, so we have kind of like a TikTok approach. We introduce silicon, we introduce system, we introduce silicon, we introduce system. So the second generation of systems is gonna be two system based on that second silicon um, that uh, is four nanometer and they're gonna have uh, uh, 40,000 LPU uh, capability on connectivity across 320 racks. Um, and then the last generation that I kind of show on this slide is, is really pushing that even, even higher across uh, 600 uh, racks with a much denser uh, kind of deployment. Okay, so um, getting back down to the chip level, what's a what's an additional opportunities for power optimization that we have right so some of the superpowers that grok has brought to bear come from determinism not just determinism at the chip level where we don't use multi-level kind of caches uh we have a really flat uh organization of our memory and our compute that the software can can uh, um, not only profile and visualize but also uh control uh, but we can also control the system level and at the system level if we can do that we can actually have a lot of opportunities for power optimization as well um, so one one such opportunity is the fact that uh, the software team has full uh, control of how the data is both moving on the chip uh, and computing on the chip so this slide kind of shows um, uh, a number of waveforms. Each of these waveforms matches the, the blocks, the color of the blocks on the left um, for uh, a ResNet 50 type uh, kind of uh, workload. So it's very simple. But the key part of this slide is that the, 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 these waveforms don't come from our um, hardware team. They do not come from our post-silicon team. In fact, these waveforms are produced by the compiler team. So they actually have full visualization of how much power is being consumed on the chip uh, at each functional unit across time. So have, they have a four dimensional view of, of space and time, uh, how they're consuming power. Um, the beauty of this is that not only can the software team kind of visualize this uh, and kind of uh, leverage some of the feedback from the hardware team to understand what's allowed, what's tolerable, but they can actually control um, how the programs are compiled in order uh, to, to achieve a specific um, uh, kind of uh, um, environmental uh, kind of uh, uh, equilibrium here. 
So what I show here is in the blue line is uh, really pushing the workload to the max performance. So in this case, we're going to be pushing the power to the peak power um, and kind of getting the, uh, the job done as quickly as possible. In red, yellow, and green, what we see is a progressive reduction in the peak power limit. So we, we put a cap at 25% lower peak power, 50% lower peak power, and 75% lower peak power. And you can see the trade-off in performance. So for 25% reduction in peak power, we only lose about 0.2% in, uh, in uh, performance. Uh, for 50%, we only lose 7% in performance and so on. Um, the nice thing about this slide is not only that it allows us to kind of control our systems, but it actually shows that this is an architecture that is perfectly suited for more than more integration. So as we move to two and a half D stack, two and a half D integration, three D integration, and we're trying to stack more and more silicon in a very small area to kind of get this compute density. Um, this allows us to control every stack in a 3D stack, for example, logic on logic, we can control this uh, through software. So we can actually assign different workloads at different stacks and kind of manage both the power delivered in a, in a specific unit volume of silicon, uh, but also how we cool it. It allows us to manage reliability so we can deploy the same chips in a liquid cooled environment or uh, an air cooled or passively cooled environment, depending on how we compile uh, the program into those devices. So this is really a game changer. This is really what uh, brought me into Grok because I was really passionate about, uh, about this uh, capability. So I showed peak power. The same approach can be used for DIDT. This is a kind of a, a what happens when you pull a lot of current uh, from a chip, when the chip demands a lot of current, it creates brownouts. In other words, the regulators can't react quickly enough. There's inductance in the package. So you see these drops in voltage. What we can do is we can manage that with our system. So we can either slowly, gradually ramp up uh, the, the current demand. We can spread only the current demanding uh, peaks of the program. Uh, with different uh, uh, approaches that we haven't discussed here yet, but uh, they'll, be, they'll be announced soon. But th this gives us a capability of LDIDT, which is really one of the factors that affects uh, silent data corruption. This is the, the fails that kind of show up in, in large deployments in, in systems uh, because of brownouts in the, in the voltage supply. So that's another cool piece. Uh, I, and this is the, the, the piece that I kind of touched on. Now that you can control the power in each stack independently, now you can start stacking logic on logic. So this is typically um, kind of the holy grail for next gen silicon. Um, if you've seen, we've seen AMD, for example, stack caches on top of logic. Uh, in other words, they're just stacking SRAM, which is really low power demand. Um, but now if we can control the power of each of these dies independently uh, in a four dimensional uh, space, what you can do uh, is now manage and stack logic on logic. So now we're moving more and more towards where we eventually want to be, which is inspired by the wet processor, our brain, which is a three dimensional structure that, that can compute. Uh, so we're kind of enabling that with uh, Grok's deterministic architecture. All right, so I mentioned uh, AI models are growing, Moore's law is slowing down. Uh, what we also uh, are pursuing at Grok is uh, customized uh, silicon. In other words, silicon that takes advantage of our very regular uh, um, kind of accelerator structure, uh, which doesn't have any knocks. Data moves in clicks either north and south or east and west in one click per operation. So it's really well behaved for uh, for kind of uh, creating this uh, compiler, like a silicon compiler that you can uh, kind of instantiate this chip in a Lego block uh, fashion. Um, and if we take that and we couple it with the ability to do some uh, domain specific acceleration, in other words, we can provide models to a tool, um, get the tool to recommend um, a specific architecture that could be um, uh, valuable in both either performance or in energy efficiency, we can quickly then build multiple instantiations uh, of that core that's really customized for that workload and get 
uh, maximum efficiency uh, running that workload. So I think this is going to become more and more important as we uh, dive more and more demanding uh, compute uh, models. Um, so this also improves time to market. So uh, by having a silicon compiler, we can really quickly go from a new model that just emerged to a recommendation of an architecture that best serves that model to a silicon compiler compiling a GDS for that specific uh, model that, uh, that is uh, best suited to run that model efficiently. And the goal is to kind of pull in uh, this conventional uh, kind of silicon design cycle from the 18 months where everybody's been kind of stuck at to something 12 or even shorter. I think we're going to be eventually limited by the fab times, which are still pretty large, but the, the idea is to pull that in as, as much as possible and kind of give you serve up silicon that's going to be uh, best suited for the workloads of the future. And then as has been discussed before, our software really maps to any instantiation of that of the LPU core, no matter how it's determined. Our software team simply takes into account the parameters uh, of the chip, uh, and they can actually compile into that um, uh, core uh, directly. Um, the last two slides uh, that I wanted to spend is really touch on design center reliability. Uh, this is becoming a bigger, bigger problem. Lots of papers from Google, Facebook, and others on cores that don't call, count, mercurial cores, silent data corruption, which is really effectively just defects that pop up in the field. Some of these defects are not detected by either ECC or any type of error correction or detection, and they start corrupting um, uh, the, the, the results of a specific workload. I spent quite a bit of time at Google kind of uh, working on the hardware portion uh, of the mitigation for this strategy. Um, and we, we really have done quite a bit of work at, Go at Grok to kind of uh, enable these uh, future large deployments. So um, lots of focus on our interconnect resilience, both uh, at the chip level by kind of focusing on multiple different FEC um, uh, kind of uh, levels that kind of balance latency and, and, and kind of error um, recovery, the, the gains of the, of the kind of uh, uh, BER. Um, lots of compute and memory resilience. So we've added both uh, ability to not only monitor uh, errors in the SRAM and interconnect through ECC, but we've also added um, error checking within the compute. So we have things like MXM checksum they can actually manage whether the compute was uh, incurred some type of an error, uh, not just the memory and the interconnect. Um, and then uh, because of our regular uh, kind of architecture, we have this uh, ability to repair um, uh, kind of uh, the, the chip, both through redundant super lanes, and these could be used to both improve yield because uh, we can swap out bad super lanes with good super lanes, or we can use them uh, to, to kind of uh, use as uh, a healing a capability in the field. When a, a failure is detected, we can quickly quarantine this chip, run some workloads on it, identify bad super lanes, and then swap them up in the field and bring them back into the general compute pool um, after that quarantine time. Um, so really exciting architecture, really um, uh, kind of next gen um, are capable for more than more scaling. Um, uh, it's resilient. It has a lot of redundancy. It's very regular, so it allows very quick movement into different uh, technology nodes. It's really a, um, uh, an architecture that uh, that gets uh, somebody like me uh, super excited. Uh, so I think that's all I had. Um, open to any questions uh, at this point.